Leah is here. Leah Hirschfeld is joining us this morning. We're going to get to our in the news a little bit later on, but we have Leah and Leah is part of a team at CARD and you can go ahead and welcome her in whenever, um, Traven, so that we can see if, uh, good morning. Hey, good morning. How are you all? We're great. Good. How are you, Leah? I'm good. I, I know that, you know, Nancy, you're having problems with the platform, but I kind of dig it. It's yeah. cool. I'm glad well, you got it. And and you can hear her, Nancy. So that's yeah. that's a step in the right direction. I now, I that. love this piece of artwork that's behind your head. I know. What is that? Uh, okay. So I'm, I'm actually at my parents' house. We, um, you guys know, I'm, I'm in usually based in Oakland, California, but there were terrible fires. So we said no thank you and left to go to Chicago to my parents' house. Um, and I actually hate the, the painting behind me and I'll, I'll point it up in a second and I'll explain why my parents have had this painting for, I don't know, two decades, maybe three decades. Um, and it has scared the bejesus out of me since I was a child <laughs> and I will show you why. Oh, all right. Yeah, okay. yeah. It's beautiful when you don't see the rest of it. So there's That's this, right. this terrifying thing here and this androgynous individual on top which is fine. I love the individual on top, but this just scared me for the, like, and it's dark and terrifying. So I, I, but we're, it's a crowd. We're all horrified frame. now. Yeah. Yeah. It's terrifying. Um, but the frame is beautiful. So it, it makes me feel, you know, when I do this, I feel like I'm in a fancy art yeah. museum that just don't exactly. have to work up. So. It's working for me. All right. Well, I'm sorry I brought it up. It's traumatizing, <laughs> uh, but we're thrilled that you're here. Uh, just refresh our memory because we, we had you here last month and we had some viewers ask some specific questions that they would like to know about research. And you went on your merry way and do what you guys do over in research and um, and did some research on it. So remind everybody what your position is at CARD and why research is your thing and what they wanted you to research. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I am a research coordinator here at CARD. Um, and what that means is I luckily, I feel very privileged. I get to spend my day answering questions like the parent who asked the question, and I'll say what it was in a little bit. Um, I get to answer questions for our caregivers. I get to answer questions for our clinicians so that we're providing the best therapeutic outcomes we can for our patients. Um, it also means I get to look at some data. I get to run research studies. Um, all again to really provide the best empirical evidence and support our patients and their and the caregivers. Um, so on that note, I get to come on here every month and and try my best at you know explaining different things. And a caregiver last month um, asked about if I remember correctly, it was a mother who had three children all diagnosed with autism, and she had been told that her risk level or risk is not the right word but her the possibility of having a child with autism after having one child with autism went down which is not accurate from everything that i have read and looked at um and actually your your likelihood goes up if you have one child with autism the likelihood you have a second child with autism goes up and then the likelihood that you have a third child with autism if you have two children with autism goes up again um so with that, though, you know, she was asking about genetics and the role of genetics in, in the diagnosis of autism and kind of where we're at with genetics research. And we're at some cool places and some um, still, you know, we don't know the one gene that causes autism, but um, I will launch into, you know, my spiel about genetics and please feel free to ask questions. It was amazing to have a caregiver ask me this question because I didn't have to rack my brain about, you know, what caregivers want to hear. So if you are watching or if you jump in later, please, please, please let us know if you have a question. I can come on next month and answer. Um, or I can always be reached at research at centerforautism.com. Um, and I, I'm happy to kind of dig into more questions. Um, on this spiel of genetics, I'm not going to be getting too deep into a specific gene or mutation. We won't dive deep into those scary terms. Um, but if, for example, you know your child has a specific mutation or you're concerned about a specific mutation, anything like that, throw it in the comments, throw me an email, throw Shannon an email, whatever, it'll get my way and I can always dig more research into it for you. Um, so with that, I'll give a caveat. Um, like I said, I'm a research coordinator, I'm not a geneticist. Um, so I'm gonna try my best here. Um, and it, you might ask me a question that I don't know the answer to because I just don't have that knowledge, but I am more than happy to go on my merry way and find more research and find an answer. Um, so I'm gonna try my best. Um, and with that whole spiel <laughs> already, 
Um, I'll launch into this, gene this genetics conversation. Um, and so, like I was saying, there isn't one gene that causes ASD. Or, um, there's not one genetic mutation we can point to. Um, there does seem to be a heritable genetic component, right? People like that, there's a higher risk of um, a higher possibility of having a child with autism if you already have a child with autism. Uh, and we'll discuss a little bit more about that as I go further. Um, but there's also, you know, there's these autism is also caused by mutations, which are genetic mutations that are completely new to the family line. Um, they were present for the first time in a family member. They weren't passed down by a parent, they weren't passed down by a sibling, aunt, uncle, anything like that. And they're just new mutations. And that happens a lot of the time as well. Um, so like I said, there's no one brain region here, no one gene, no one cell type uniquely implicated. And there's a bunch of different causes that we're seeing. We're, caught, we're seeing this heritable um, component, and then we're also seeing these new mutations that are just being introduced into the family line. Um, and so before I launch into everything, there are two different models that geneticists throw around about the cause for ASD. Um, and one of them is this model that there is one highly penetrant mutation and someone's going to win the Nobel Prize one day and find that mutation or a very few slight, you know, handful of mutations that are sufficient to cause ASD. Um, and that's this one major gene kind of idea, right? That one day we'll just find that gene. Um, and then there's another model. And this other model is that there's many inherited variants that contribute to ASD. Each has a small effect. And when you combine that with environmental factors, that results in the risk of developing the disease. And it's not that either of these model is definitively correct right now, and it's not that these are mutually exclusive. We might have a, you know, that model that has that one gene, and someone might find that one gene, and it caused, you know, it explains 20% of the cases. And then we might still also have this other model of, the, you know, all these contributing factors of ASD, these genetic risks, these environmental factors, all these things that then causes you to develop the disease, and, and that might explain 20%, and then another 20% might be these mutations that are brand new to the family. So none of these are mutually exclusive, but these are just both the ideas that are kind of floating around in the research, floating around in Genesis's head. Um, and so what I'm going to go through now is I'm going to talk about the different neural components that we're seeing developing into symptoms that we see with, with autistic individuals and those mutations that seem to be playing with those. Um, and then I'm going to go into, you know, your risk factors and also why as a caregiver, as an aunt, as an uncle, as a sibling of someone who has autism, why you might care about this whole spiel anyway, right? Because um, it's all really cool, but like, that's great. I'm not just here necessarily for a knowledge base, though I totally am as well, but also so you have some takeaways. Um, so one of the things that you, you may have heard um, is that there are mutations in genes in autistic individuals that go that that involve how our neurons communicate to each other, right? How these synapses are talking to each other, and when these synapses don't fire in the same way that neurotypical individuals do, we see the processing of neural information differently in an autistic individual, right? They that might be why we see behavioral consequences, cognitive consequences, and whatnot. Um, and with the synaptic dysfunction, with these synapses not talking to each other in the way that neurotypical individuals' synapses talk to each other, um, it's also seen in other disorders, um, such as epilepsy. And so that's part of the reason why this theory about um, why we see more diagnosis of epilepsy in individuals with autism is because of those genetic mutations that are causing synapses to communicate funky. Um, and funky is the wrong word. I don't know what the right word is because it's not like one's right and one's funky, one's not funky. But I'm going to use neurotypical and funky. And uh, please excuse me if there's a better word and I'm just not familiar with it yet. Um, but anyway, so that's why we, we hypothesize that we're seeing more individuals with epilepsy in the autistic community than in the general population. And one of the reasons why... Um, you know, we compare things to the general population is that's the way researchers are like, hey, this is funky. This is weird. If we see something in the general population showing up one, two percent, then if it's the same in the autistic population, we're seeing it one or two percent, then that's probably not something where something where that's probably not where something's going wrong, where something's funky or whatnot. So that's why, you know, when you compare to the general population, that's why you're always doing that in research. 
Um, and that's why when I talk about this epilepsy and things like that, it's compared to the general population. Um, so that's one of the genetic mutations. It's one of one of the genetic mutations causes these synaptic dysfunctions. And there's a lot of genes there that might be interacting in that way that causes this synapsis to dysfunction. Um, one of the other things that we see is that some of these mutations are causing, and I, I think this is a fairly common or well-known one, um, that they're just extra synapses in the brain, right? That these synapses aren't aren't being taken away for whatever reason to make room for information and for connections. And that that's one of those mutations are causing that, that inconsistency, that difference that we're seeing. Um, and then there's also a lot going on in the brain, different parts in the, in the brain. Um, so they think that there might be a genetic component to the amygdala. Amygdala is a very cool thing. Uh, it's a role is in modulating fear and also social behavior. And we're not really sure, I say we, I'm not a geneticist, so, but the genetic community um, is not really sure how this might be affecting autism, um, but they do think it is. Um, and so what they're looking at is like how the amygdala develops over time, its role in anxiety. And one really recent study that, that came out this month, uh, sorry, came out in September, we're in October, whoa, um, <laughs> that came out in September, um, found that they looked at amygdala reactions and during facial expressions in autistic individuals found a weak response from the amygdala while they, while autistic individuals were looking at facial expressions. So again, you know, I'm pointing all these things out to say, we might want to know what, what genes are causing these mutations. And these are the results of those mutations that, you know, your neurons aren't talking to each other the right way or the neurotypical way uh neuron pruning isn't happening the same way um the amygdala is doing some funky stuff and isn't doing the same reactions that we see in neurotypical individuals um and there's another cool part of the brain that is involved in motor and reward systems um and so that part of the brain we've identified is thought to be involved in the repetitive behavior and motor routine learning. You can see where this is going, right? So, so in mouse models, um, they saw a reduced ability to store and process information in this part of the brain, which could lead to difficulty in new motor patterns, disengaging from current ones. And you know, all of these genes are kind of affecting what's going on in your head. Um, okay, enough about how those genes are affecting. You know, great, that's all cool. So why why are we caring about this? Well, you know. If you have a child that already has autism, you have a higher risk of having a second child with autism. Um, autism Speaks found, had a study that found that the odds are one in five, 20 percent. Um, and if you already have two children that have autism, the possibility that you have a third child with autism, I saw range from 12 percent to 50 percent. And th those are pretty high odds. Um, and another study found that if you had if you as a caregiver, as you as a parent, had an aunt or an uncle with autism, then you also had an increased risk of having a child with autism. Um, and I, I mention all of this because the next point I'm gonna share is like, that's so what? This is all cool, this is all really interesting, but why is this exciting? Um, and I'll tell you, I didn't know about any of this until about four days ago. Um, but one of the takeaways from this, I think, is um, that, you know, understanding the genetic profile of your child may help in understanding what's going on in the brain and those deficits you're seeing. Um, and I had no idea. So the CDC actually does recommend genetic testing for some children with some caveats. Um, but also, and I, I was shocked. I was like, that's cool, but this is like sci-fi, right? No. So health insurance also potentially covers genetic counseling and genetic profiling for your child. Um, and I'm not coming, I, you know, each family needs to decide what they want to do and what's best for them. Some families would find it really helpful to understand, and some families would find it incredibly stressful. So whatever you as a caregiver, you as a family are interested in um, and would make you feel better and make you feel more comfortable, um, you should do. But it's something to talk about that, you know, genetic testing for your child might be interesting and might be more than interesting. It might help to understand the mutations and the causes that you're seeing. And, you know, uh, we study genetics, not just so we can say that's really cool, but so we can provide personalized or precision medicine for that individual. And this is all, you know, 
I'm going to quote a bunch of studies that came out last month. Like this is cool new stuff. Um, and one study that was published last month by Arnett and her colleagues found that each genetic cause, so they looked at a bunch of different mutations and that those mutations had different early developmental mil milestones that explained the overall functioning of that child later on. So if you, yeah, so, so if you know, like, you know, you do the genetic testing, you do genetic counseling, again, not a geneticist, not a genetic counselor, so I don't know what they'll tell you. Um, but if you do all of that and then, you know, you say, okay, great, my kid has a mutation at the SNR gene. I don't know if that's a real gene, I just made it up. Um, then there may be studies out there that say, okay, great, that child is probably going to have cognitive issues. Let's focus on cognitive issues. That child might have development. Okay, like, and then, you know, this study specifically was about milestones of age of walking, first word spoken, things like that. And they found that those correlated differently in the different groups of mutated genes and the different individuals, different groups of mutated genes to overall functioning. And so then we can say, okay, great. That child's going to have social communication deficits more so than X or Y or Z. So let's focus on that, right? So, so you know, these genes, these genetic things and, and what I was talking about, you know, about how the brain's talking differently and whatnot, all of that might be able to help provide a better picture. And like I said, you know, you you might have you'll you may have a higher risk of having a child with autism if you're as a parent you have a aunt and uncle or something so if you do these genetic testings and you have other children when they decide to family plan they may have a better understanding of their risks of having a child you know your grandchild having a child of autism and things like that and risk is not the right word here and i keep forgetting i'm not i, I don't want to use it it's just an increased probability right um so an increased probability of, of that. And again, if you, if as a parent, if you have a sister who's going to be family planning, it may be interesting to them and useful to them to know about that genetic makeup of your child, because that genetic makeup could be those new mutations that are first time ever introduced into your family. And, you know, or it could be, okay, you've got this risk. And we know it's going to cause social communication deficits. Let's make sure we're paying attention to your niece, to your grandchild, to make sure that those social communication deficits aren't seen. Or if they are, bam, let's get them into therapy by year one, year two, whatever, right? Sooner the better for all of this. Um, so that's my big takeaway, uh, you know, and it's so interesting. And, and I wish I could come on here and say we have the gene. We don't yet. But there's really cool and useful research going on about the different genes and how they interact and as a caregiver if you choose this route like i said it can be very stressful to know the genetic makeup and things like that so you obviously make the choice that makes the make most sense for you and your family but if you go down that route you can always talk to your bcba and say we did the genetic profile my child has the mutation here what can you find out and they can do research and see if there's more deficits in different areas or more strengths right like oh this kid is great at x right because of that genetic makeup. Um, so very cool. And like I said, I had no idea your health insurance may cover this. So it's definitely worth, if it's interesting to you, um, definitely worth having a conversation with your primary care physician, your pediatrician, figuring out if you need a um, recommendation before you go to a genetic counselor or anything like that, figuring out how much and what your health insurance will cover. But it's a question, it's it's worth asking the question if you're interested in it. Um, and it may be helpful and beneficial to not just you, but to your children as they child plan, your family plan several years down the road or however old your children are, um, or your siblings, right, as they family plan and things. So it's, it, it's really interesting and it's worth asking if you're interested about it. Fascinating stuff. I have a couple of questions and I'm sure that Nancy does too. Um, th this... Genetic testing has come a long way in the last couple of years because a couple of years ago, we, first we had one company on that was pretty cutting edge and doing things that we that other people weren't doing, and then since then there have been a lot other companies that it's it's much more mainstream than it was even two years ago mm -hmm. to go and get your child uh, genetic tested. I know when Jem was diagnosed, the very first thing that they asked us to do was to go across the hall and to give blood to have him tested for fragile X. Mm -hmm. and that was the only thing that we were made aware of. He got tested, of course, and did not have fragile X. But we've been saying for years, and Nancy can attest to this too, that if you eat just that one alone, if you get your child tested and your child does has, have fragile X, 
it directs their health care for the rest of their life for a whole bunch of things that you would want to be aware of. So for that reason alone, we've been telling people go and do uh, genetic testing. I have not had gem genetic tested. Um, I keep saying I'm going to do it, but I haven't done it. And I just recently, I'm, in fact, I'm waiting for my results. I did the 23andMe um, genetic, uh, the, the one that um, also does your medical as well. Uh, because I, I want to know more about heritage and, and things of that nature. And I want to be connected if there are relatives that I don't know. But we also are interested to see things, you know, the, uh, I'm interested to see if I have the BRCA gene. Um, there's all of those things. But Nancy, did you ever decide to have Wyatt tested? No, I did not have Wyatt tested. And interestingly enough, he has had two seizures. And I don't know whether the testing would have shown epilepsy on his side or not. Um, In I fairness to both of us. You know, by the time the genetic testing came out, our kids were so much older that it, that it was not as imperative. But I think if I think if our kids were being diagnosed today, I think both of us would run out and do it. Don't you? Yeah, I think I would if, if he was diagnosed today, for sure. There we go. But uh, my other question for you is... Um, I know that on a regular basis, you guys take research that's out there and you write it up for the card community, for the every, everybody to be aware so that everybody isn't having to go out and constantly be looking at research. I'm wondering, are you going to write this up for the card community? Actually, that Arnek and colleagues that article I talked about um, that showed that there was developmental differences um, and, and milestones that, that different milestones that... Um, individuals with different mutations hit that then have later trajectory is written up for our October newsletter. And that will be sent out. And that also, you know, that's where I take off the, like the so what's and things, you know, that that is where we try to hit that home to clinicians as well. And always, if any clinicians are watching or, or if, you know, you're a parent and you talk to your clinician, that, that October newsletter hasn't gone out yet. It will be sometime this month. Um, but those BCBAs, anyone practicing is always welcome to send a note to the research team. Again, research at centerforautism.com um, or just look me up, Leah Hirschfeld. Um, and always, always, you know, you can throw in, I have a client who's been genetically tested. They have this mutation. What can you tell me what's out there? Um, or, you know, I'm really interested in the clinical implications of this. What can you tell me? And we, we try to tell everyone what those clinical implications are, but you know, again, this genetic testing is in part so we can be really patient specific and provide everyone with the best care suited for themselves because everyone is different. Um, and that includes genes, right? So so that's where, you know, we can really provide a more in-depth analysis um, or, or you know, say, you know, there's nothing out there yet, but we'll keep an eye out, right? Things like that. So yes, we are writing this up um, for the October newsletter. Wonderful. And I have a follow-up to that question, but we have a viewer, and I don't know that you're going to have the answer for this, uh, But and you've said many times, I'm not a geneticist, <laughs> nor do you do genet genetic testing, but somebody said, I had my son uh, done all kinds of genetic testing and everything came back normal, but he also has a lot of first and second cousins that have autism too. And are we missing a test? And I do know that when we were, when we have had people on, they do a microarray micro um, test and not all places test the same thing. Do you know anything about that? I don't, um, you know, if, if you want to make sure whoever that caregiver, if you're watching, like I said, reach out to researcher research at centerforautism.com, or if you have Shannon's email, send her a note and she'll forward it over to me. Um, let me know what tests you've done, and I'll take a look out there and see if I can find additional research or support for you. Um, I mean, I, and, and, you know, this is still very, I think they've been doing genetic testing for the last decade or two decades, but it's still new and upcoming, so it might be whatever that, whatever is implicating or, ha, uh, you know, affecting your child may not be something that is able to be tested for at the moment. Um, but send me a note, you know, send Shannon a note. Let me know what tests you've done if you're comfortable with that. Um, and I will try to take a look and see what I can find for you. And and keep in mind, I don't know how long ago you had your child tested, but it seems like they're updating these. I remember, because we've been doing this show for nine years now. And I remember the first show that we did, Nancy, where they said, uh, we've, we've identified a gene that plays a role in autism, the very first one. Uh -huh. And it was like, oh my gosh, this is exciting. 
And then it was maybe three months later that they found three more. And we were like, look at that. There's four genes that play a role in autism. And then by the next year, they had found 27 more. And that was years ago. I have no idea what the count is up to now. Um, but just keep in mind that things will change over time. But um, I, my question, and the reason why I was asking about, are you going to write it up for card is because some of you know that Dr. Dixon, who D Dr. Dennis Dixon, who works at CARD, it's been his mission for a lot of years and CARD's mission with him to phenotype autism. Mm -hmm. And that um, CARD has really been at the, the cutting edge of this. And Dr. Dixon and his team, part of which you are a part of, have been able to identify 17 distinct types of autism based on behavioral clusters. But that you also were, were taking that and comparing that with uh, bio, what's the word? I always call it the poop word, but there's, there's a better word for it. Uh, Biogenetic, uh, bio something bio or other. Biomedical markers? Biomedical markers. So you guys took uh, poo and urine and, and looked at what was in those and saw if there were clusters to, to, uh, to identify different people and then are trying to match them up to the phenotype. But I'm also wondering if Dr. Dixon has thought about now adding the genetic component to it. And I'd love for you to have a conversation with him about that. Yeah, absolutely. We, I, we, I can always throw it up to Karen, um, who's the head of research and she can bring it up to Dennis as well. Um, I wonder if there's regulations and rules about trying to find out people's genetic profiles. Um, but it, it's a good question. We have so much data and yeah. being able to, you know, attach a phenotype to a genotype would be very, very informative. And I do think there's some research out there about it. But um, again, we have so much information there um, that being able to do that would be potentially very beneficial. Again, so that, you know, if if genetic testing becomes more prevalent, if you choose to get your t your child tested, and you say, okay, great, I, you know, this gene is implicated, we can say, great, this is the phenotype we expect them to present, and these are the behavioral implications that we can really target at an early age, right, and make sure that this is going on. Um, well, and, and that is the whole point. I mean, I've been saying since we first did the show and started talking about phenotyping is that someday, instead of saying autism, there'll be a name for each type of autism, and I hope it's something, you know, like, you know, uh, Tweedledee number four, <laughs> you know, whatever it is. Um, because right now, when you say that your child has autism, I mean, Nancy and I both have wonderful sons that we love that are on the autism spectrum. And from day one, they had some symptoms that were the same, but some that are vastly different. Um, and, and, and yet when we say autism to somebody, they, they think of the one person with autism that they know. Right. Drives, drives us all bonkers. But beyond that, what I've already learned from CARD phenotyping autism is that there is one cluster of kids that has an eye tracking issue. And when they have the eye tracking issue, they don't, they don't catch a ball well. Mm -hmm. and, and in our case, we were on the ball catching thing and it wasn't going well. And I said, let's move off of it. Let's move on to the next thing. But then he had problems with handwriting. And then he had problems riding a bike. And then he had, you know, this problem, this problem, this problem. And what CARD has been able to identify by looking at lots of different kids and looking at their behavioral progress is that in that cluster of kids that there is an eye tracking problem. And that if we spend longer on the ball catching, that the other skills we don't have to spend as long on. Like how much would that have helped us on, you know, day 300 when I said, forget the ball thing. So he's not going to be, you know, uh, a, a professional baseball player. Let's move on. I would have stayed longer. And to that point, you know, tying back into the genetic aspect of this, as you're talking about this motor issue that you saw, um, there, that, there is a part of the brain that's been identified for that motor function and that reward system. And the reward system seems to also deal with attention, which could implicate eye tracking. Like as you're ta talking about all that, it might not be surprising that eye tracking, attention, and motor is all connected because of this one part of the brain that they've identified. And wouldn't it be great if, you know, with a genetic test, I don't even know if this is capable, but 
not a geneticist, <laughs> but, right. but you know, you, you do the genetic testing after a year, you know, all this information. And then with that phenotype, you already know we need to focus on the ball throwing and we're going to see that. Exactly. And what then we would get further faster. Absolutely. <laughs> it's pretty cool. Nancy, did you have any questions? I'm as usual, I'm over talking. I think I, I think Leah's made it all very clear, very easy to understand. Thank you guys so much. Uh, now, we did have somebody who asked the question, and again, I'm not expecting you to know the answer, but they were wanting to know, why do more boys get this than girls? Are we seeing that in genetic testing? So, okay. so you know, I, I did see it a few times when I was doing the research. You know, we're seeing that, uh, oh, God, this, so this is, I'm trying to, like, like, make all my thought processes work here. So we do see that, um, you know, boys are being diagnosed more, and there's this idea that there's a female protectiveness that if you're a woman um that you're, you're you know you were born as a biological female um you have a protective mechanism there that is protecting against the autism deficits the autism things that you're seeing um but i will preface all and that might be why you're seeing more boys than girls um but i will preface all of that by you know there's a lot of research coming out and i've come on a few times to talk about it that kind of one there seems to be that you know that there might be a misdiagnosis of of women of girls and that they're being diagnosed later so it might seem like you know men or boys are being diagnosed more frequently and that if you're a boy you have a higher risk of having autism but it i don't know if that's necessarily true because you know we're seeing some results here that are saying there's a misdiagnosis that you have to be much more you have to have much more severe autistic traits as a woman and that you're being diagnosed much, much later in life. And so those, you know, those stats might not be reflecting that. Um, and also, I, I mentioned one of these studies, it was the first study in September of 2020, that showed that if you had that first degree relative, so if you were a caregiver, and you had a sibling, uh, or, uh, you know, a sibling that had, this is supposed to be a boy and a girl sibling, but it doesn't matter. Um, if you had a sibling that had autism, you then had more likelihood of having a child with autism. Um, and that, that article found that if you, if it was an aunt and uncle on the maternal side or the paternal side, so if you were the mom with the sibling with autism or a dad with a sibling with autism, it didn't matter if you were the dad or the woman or the mom who had the sibling with autism. And I point that out because the researchers made the argument that that might dispel this female protectiveness idea. Because if it was protective, you would potentially see the mom having less likelihood of passing down any autistic uh, genetic mutations or anything like that if it's coming off of her side versus the father. If being a female somehow is protective of that and they didn't see that so i'm hesitant to say exactly why we're seeing more boys than girls being diagnosed there was nothing pinpointing a specific genetic thing there it was like this gene only affects men like you know um color blindness you men have it more because they only need one x and women have both x's whatever anyway um that there's nothing like that so i'm more concerned that there's the reason we're seeing that is misdiagnosis or something like that. And the more research I've seen come out this year leads me more to suspect something like that. But that's not to say, you know, that there isn't a female protectiveness. There might be. It's just that we haven't found anything definitive there, I think. And a parent wrote in and said, as the parent of a girl diagnosed with moderate to severe autism at three years old after a massive regression, and having worked in three different middle and elementary schools, I do not see a difference in behaviors based on gender. I see the differences based on the degree of damage the child may have and how responsive they may or may not be to the uh, to the day to day with Asperger characteristics. I can see how boys and girls may behave different, but in my mind, gender differences rule, not diagnosis. My opinion. And thank you for sharing that with us. Um, so, uh, I, I think it's so important that people, as you said, choose how informed that they want to be on this. Um, it's, a, it's such a private thing. Nancy, have you done any of the 23 and me yourself or is anybody in your family? I have not. Will you explain what that is, Shannon, for those, our viewers who don't know? Well, there are lots of companies that do this, but 23 and me is a pretty mainstream company and, 
basically it's um <clears throat> You know, your basic genetic testing, although now they have, they've added the medical component to it. Right. So you can, you can pay just for the genetic component to see like where, you know, what your genes say about what your, your, um, your background is, like where your ancestors came from are, are you know, in, in my childhood, I was always told that I was Irish. And I, my first name is is based on the last name of the family member, which is Shannon, right? Uh, which is very Irish. And and so everything, my favorite color was green. And I was, you know, raised to, you know, we, we had the local uh, Italian-American uh, company. That, um, trying to think, it's sort of like, um, you know, the... the I'm trying to think what uh, what a, an equivalent is, but like the Elks, right? And and I I played on their softball team, and everything was about being Irish. That was a part of my identity. And I started doing our genealogy and found out that you know we were in Ireland for seven seconds. I'm Scottish, <laughs> and and it was like a real wake up call. It was like I didn't nobody told me I was Scottish, right? Well, apparently you can get your blood tested and find me. And I'm waiting to see. I might come back and be French. And it, it might change my entire outlook of things, right? Whatever. So that was of interest, right? But I had asked for it for my birthday. And, and my husband said, you know, let's let now that you can get the, the medical one too, let's take a look at that. So by doing this, I can find out if I'm positive for the BRCA gene which is the gene for breast cancer. I have many aunts who have had breast cancer and my mother had at least one breast cancer um, scare that led her to do a breast reduction. Right. Um, and I, you know, maybe I need to know that. Now it's really dicey because some people don't want to know that. Um, I, I know that a few years ago, another member of my family went and got tested for a bunch of things one that I particularly did not want to know and came back and, um, and told everybody that they were positive for it. I think it's really dicey. And I think um, they got a lot of guff from me included that I said, Hey, have you not heard that? Like you're supposed to ask, do you want to know what my results were? Because it's some people don't want to know and some people do. And I think with autism, you got to decide for yourself, like, do I want to know? But we're telling you there might be some benefits from knowing. But if you don't want to know, that's your business, right? Right. How expensive, um, how expensive is that test, Jen? So to just find out, uh, like, what your heritage is, I think it was like $79. But to do the, the medical one um, was 199 Okay. And and you got to do this, you got to spit into a tube and you got to ship that off. And then it takes like a month. I still don't have my results back. Um, but I decided that I'm in a place that I wanted to know. Right. Um, so, you know, that's where I, and, and I'm more interested, I got to say, in the heritage side, but I decided that I, for, you know, personal reasons that I'm, you know, I'm at an age where I'd like to know. If, like, if I find out that I'm positive for the BRCA gene, I think I'll change some of the things I'm doing. Uh -huh. I don't know how much, but I think I'll change some of the things that I'm doing. Right. Um, years ago, I, I changed my diet because I realized that my aunts uh, had gone through this and that I needed to be smart. And I did. I changed my diet substantially um, so that I would be less likely to, but, but back then, they didn't even know about the BRCA gene. So there we go. And you couldn't get tested for it. But now, as you said, a lot of times your health insurance company will pay for some of these genetic testing things. You can just go right to them. You don't have to go to a 23andMe. I kind of want to know if I'm Scottish or if I'm French. So <laughs> I want, uh, and by the way, I'm, I'm Scottish royalty. I, I hate to throw that up to people, Are but you really? I really am. I, um, I, I really am. I'm Scottish royalty. I, I like, I can prove it on a piece of paper. I'm, I'm like three millionth in line, uh, for the, the crown, uh, in, in England, even I'm, I'm related to the Royal family in England. They don't know, they don't care, but, uh, but I enjoy it. 
Someone says, how can you assess a child and be able to discover that he or she has autism spectrum disorder? That's a whole other thing because right now we don't have definitive testing. Uh, there, there are ways that you can test that are growing um, with saliva to be able to diagnose and they're getting much more, uh, we've had them on the show, clarify. Um, but that you cannot ha get a diagnosis just from that. It can go in, in conjunction with a diagnosis from a developmental pediatrician or a licensed psychologist. Um, you have to have someone that is trained and certified to be able to diagnose an autism spectrum disorder. Pediatricians, general pediatricians, um, do not diagnose for autism. They screen for autism and make a recommendation to go to the developmental pediatrician. And there are many tests for autism. Uh, I, I don't know whether you're asking specifically about a genetic test for autism, or if you're asking about tests when you go to see the developmental pediatrician. A lot of times they do uh, the ADOS. The ADOS is sort of the standard that they use, but it's not the only one by any stretch of the imagination. Uh, and I'm just checking other questions. So any other questions for our fabulous, uh, you know, wonderful researcher that we have with us? Uh, we let Leah go. Or uh, anything you guys want to see next month, um, anything like that, uh, throw it out there. It's super helpful to me. So. Okay. They are asking specifically about a genetic test for autism. And the only one that I'm aware of that's available um, uh, now for, for purchase is Clarify. We've had them on the show. If you want to go to our homepage and put in Clarify with an I, and you'll see, uh, or you can just Google Clarify, but they are currently, you can through your doctor at your doctor's, off, doctor's office do a genetic test for autism, you ask for clarify, but you, you need to know that it will not, it has to go in companion with another diagnosis. It doesn't have the ability. It is a predictor uh, only at this point. How about testing for adults? What is the process for getting tested for adults? There is no genetic test for adults right now. Even with clarify, their results are not showing that um, they have the accuracy I think over the age of eight, please don't quote me, but I think that it's over eight that they don't currently, their their research is not showing that they have any form of accuracy. So uh, look at that. Um, Traven just was able to put up um, the link to when we had them on the show. Uh, so there we are. But uh, Leah, I, I just thank you so much. It's so great to have you on the show and talking about these topics. We'll, we'll keep our ear to the rail. I know when we did the genetic, genetic questions, somebody else had asked another question and you said you needed more time. Do you remember what that topic was? Yeah, there was another question about gut and micro, um, mm. microbiomes. I'm, I'm going to say that word. I think that's right. Um, and I'm absolutely happy to come on next month and work on gut microbiomes. Um, if that seems like something y'all want to know about, absolutely. Oh, we, we so want to know about that. I mean, and I'm not even being a little facetious. Don't we want to know about that, yes, Nancy? Absolutely. Yeah. Very Great. common, very common concern and question for parents. And I'll tell you specifically, I mean, I remember a couple of years ago that there was a big announcement that Autism Speaks had a huge amount of money that they were putting into research on the gut. And it was in the millions. I don't know whether it was 2 million or 10 million, somewhere in the millions that they were going to do on gut research. And sometimes research comes out and they don't identify and go, hey, we were one of the grant recipients on that. But I'd love to know what did that, you know, cartload of money get us? Yeah, um, I will preface. I don't know um, if there will be many satisfying answers that I'm going to come yeah. on here with. Um, but I'm happy to, you know, let everyone know where the state of the research is, try to find out where that money went um, and, and see what I can find for gut and microbiome. Yeah, absolutely. And I don't necessarily want to know what, where the money went. I want to know what, what's our takeaway for it. Like, did we spend, you know, not we, but, you know, did Autism Speak spend, for instance, $7 million? And what we found out is that kids shouldn't be eating, um, you know, sugared cereals. Like, that's what I want to know. 
Yeah, was it worth it? Did we get a big takeaway? I think that they, I think they did come out with a study that showed there was a correlation between the gut and the brain, but I don't know how specific they got with that. Okay. Well, hopefully you'll be able to tell us that next month. I think we already have our date scheduled. Is I think so. Early? early November. All right. Thank you. We so appreciate you. Thank you guys so much. Thanks for having me on. And for all the great questions, y'all. Have a good Thank one. You. All right. Have a Bye-bye. Great. Hey, thanks for watching Autism Live. To subscribe, click here. And if you'd like to check out some more of our videos, click here.